Well, we got a guy, um, got a story about a guy here that uh, is probably one of my favorite modern blues guitarists. And it's Mr. Joe Bonamassa. I know this is going to sound really strange. Joe Bonamassa names his favorite boss distortion pedal and his pick may surprise you. Oh, I want to hear from you guys first before we reveal what this, what this pedal is. I want to hear from you guys. What pedal in the terms of the boss distortion pedals do you think is Joe Bonamassa's favorite? Is it the DS one? DS two. Is there a DS three? I believe there's a DS three. Is it one of those? Is that what it is? Or, you know, could it possibly be maybe an overdrive that many people classify as that of a distortion? Because, you know, those two things do get flipped around rather often. Eddie Van Halen has a overdrive pedal, which is actually a distortion pedal. So, you know, it's important to know the differences between those. Okay. And for those who don't know, a distortion pedal would be something that kind of gets you into the chugga, 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 chugga realm. And an overdrive pedal is uh, not going to quite take you that far, but you're going to get a really, um, you're not going to quite get distortion. You're going to get the edge of break up and a little bit past that is what you're going to get. Okay. So, so what pedal do you guys think that Joe Bonamassa is out there playing that is on his pedal board? And I so know some of you guys are probably sitting over there going to Google searching saying, which boss pedal is on Joe Bonamassa's, um, on his pedal board, which, which boss pedal is on there? Which one is it? Well, we're just going to go ahead and reveal it to you here. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get into this article. Joe Bonamassa revealed that his favorite boss distortion pe pedal is the MT2 Metal Zone. What? Okay, now, now the thing with the Metal Zone, many people consider that to be the worst pedal that Boss had ever put out. Okay. But Joe Bonamassa argues that it provides some awesome mid-range tones with a clean amp. Although John, Joe Bonamassa isn't the kind of musician who's willing to confine himself within the strict boundaries of give a given genre, he usually isn't associated with heavy metal, which makes his choice all the more interesting. Speaking with Guitarist Magazine in a recent interview, the blues rock prodigy argued that his love for the MT2 Metal Zone, the high gain distortion stomp box, developed with heavy metal players driven by more is more philosophy, comes down to the era he grew up in. My favorite boss dirt pedal, and I know this is going to sound really effing strange, is the M2 metal zone according to joe bonamassa being a child in the 80s i really dug the metal zone i was a metal zone guy i thought you could get some really cool mid-range things out of it with a clean amp just because it's called the metal zone it doesn't mean that you need to run the gain all the way up needless to say joe isn't the only musician working outside the strict heavy metal sphere use of the boss's popular pedal with Warren Hayes, Prince, and even Daft Punk, all being known as Metal Zone enthusiasts at one time or another. Moreover, the Boss Metal Zone became famous even outside of the world of music when conspiracy theorists presented that its schematics as fake evidence of chips they claimed were found in... Oh, God. Found in a certain medical procedure that is being pushed on everybody right now. While clutch, I, I never heard that. Never in my life heard that. So maybe ultimate guitars make it up stuff here. I don't know. While clutch drew inspiration of the song, red alert Bosch metal zone from the iconic stomp box. 
Joe Bonamassa using a metal zone, you know, and this is something that is not outside of the norm in the pedal universe for guitar pedals. It is definitely not, it, you know, usually it's guys like uh, Josh Scott that will go and say, well, you know what? I can make that metal zone sound like a clone <laughs> or I can go and make, you know, the, uh, well, you know, the, uh, I can make, the Eric Clapton pedal, you remember the crosswords, uh, the, the crossroads pedal that was just absolutely horrible. And I love Clapton. That was one dog crap pedal. He, he, you know, if he ended up going and saying, I can make that sound like a clone centaur or make it do this or that, or, you know, use a preamp to make it sound like a dumble or something of that sort. Oh my gosh. The crosswords or the crossroads pedal would uh, be selling for like $600 right now. Everybody who has one of those has been collecting dust in their closet somewhere. They'd be going and pulling those things out. And, um, yeah. So that's where we're at right now is that, yeah, you know, one of the things I've learned is a lot of the gear that I have, a lot of the stuff is not used for what I use it for, but I've drawn inspiration from other guitarists, such as, you know, you take, for instance, you got, um, octave pedals, you know, it was something that was used in eighties rock. It was a very popular thing, but you had, um, and fuzz as well was something that was used in like heavy metal rock, all that stuff. But you had Kenny Wayne Shepard that says, you know what? I'm going to use an octave fuzz, two things that are associated with rock and metal. And I'm going to make a, an awesome blues tone out of that. And he did it with blue on black as well as many other, you know, just incredible songs of his. He was able to do that. The clone centaur used to sell for $250. When certain people started putting it on their boards, like John Mayer, you now have to pay five, six thousand dollars for a clon centaur. Whenever it is that John Josh Scott had made the bad monkey sound exactly like clon in a mix, the bad monkey ended up going and selling for about six hundred dollars for a couple of months. The thing is that when it comes to guitar gear. Sometimes you think outside the box and sometimes you think out of the box in a way of, I don't have this. Let's see if I can use this to make that. And essentially that's what Joe Bonamassa did as a kid in the eighties. Nowadays, he's known as a guy with all the expensive amps, all the expensive boutique amps and guitars. They are probably owned by Joe Bonamassa. Many guitars that are considered to be a piece of history or amps that are considered to be a piece of history. Joe Bonamassa has them in his garage, but it's so interesting that he will go and take a metal zone and use that to get those amazing blues tones that he gets. And he's absolutely right. When I was using pedals and especially when using distortion as a kid, I would go and turn those things all the way up. I would never get into the nuances of rolling down this is like turn your treble all the way up, turn your gain all the way up. And guess what? You're going to be able to make squeals. Now you're going to be able to get those harmonics and all that stuff. You don't want to play any rhythm with that because that is going to sound like total and complete dog crap. But you know, I, I, that's all that I knew now that I've gotten older. It's like one of those things that I'm, I'm getting more into different tones, you know, this will fit this. This doesn't fit that. You know, how do I go about getting this? And sometimes I'm very unconventional. One of the things that I've done is, uh, for instance, not many people have, have done this, is I've gone and taken some of the pedals that are on my Tonex, the captures of things like the Clon Centaur, and have run them into my neural DSP plugins uh, to get that overdrive, that particular overdrive out of them, or I'll go and run a Fender Hammertone fuzz into uh, before my uh, audio interface and into there to get uh, certain toes. And I did that a lot. 
on the last album that I ended up doing, the blues album I did called Smoke and Neon, I did that with quite a few pedals going into neural DSP plugins. And it's so funny because everybody's asking for this pedal to be added to this plugin, that pedal and all that stuff. And it's like, if you have the pedal, you can add it yourself. And many people don't, don't realize that. And sometimes it's like taking what it is that you have saying, can I do this with the things that I have? And the thing is that when you're left to your own devices, you find out ways in order to make those things work. And that's what uh, quite a few innovators have had to do. When you go and you look at some of the famous guitars, like Eddie Van Halen's Frankenstrat, for instance, you got a Gibson pickup down there. And you got, you know, there are many things that he ended up doing. He liked the tone of the Gibson, but the feel of the neck and also being able to have the ability to have a tremolo. He needed a Strat style body for that. Never used the neck pickup, so he just kind of put a dummy pickup in there. All that stuff. This was considered to be inventive, so much so that guitar companies such as Floyd Rose came about saying, let us go and make something for you, Ed. Let's go and make something so you don't have to worry about your tuning whenever it is that you go and you do those dive bombs. Because, you know, for those who don't know, using a Floyd Rose, you can do dive bombs all day long. Your, your guitar is going to stay in tune. You don't want a Floyd Rose equipped guitar to be your first guitar. Okay. Because I'll tell you that those things are a nightmare to tune and restring. They're a nightmare in terms of that. But, you know, seasoned players, you know, that became something that was really popular in the 80s. It morphed that 80s sound because you were able to to do those things, being able to do them not only on the record, but you're able to do them live as well without your guitar going and sounding like the uh, theme song from Psycho after going and doing a dive bomb. So, you know, that's how it is in the guitar industry. Flower pedal, Terry Nee, how dare you? How dare you, sir? No, not a flower pedal. <laughs> 